Uh, this talk is about resilient forests. Uh, it's a term which has really come into uh, a sort of knowledge over the last five years or so. Uh, sustainability has been around a, a, a bit longer. But I'm just going to ask three very simple questions about resilient forests. I'm going to say, what are they? How do we achieve them? And then I'm going to ask whether or not our knowledge base at the moment is good enough for the creation of a much more f uh, resilient forest estate uh, in the future. Okay, so the big challenge as far as I'm concerned for the forestry industry in this country is how can we adapt forests to increase resilience to biotic threats and climate change? And these last three words are really very, very important whilst maintaining productivity. We've got a very well developed wood processing industry uh, in this country and we really have to keep that going. It's very important in terms of jobs and in terms of economic growth. So maintaining productivity is going to be a very uh, important part of, of what I'm going to be talking about uh, in terms of resilience. Okay, so I said earlier in my, my remarks that this term resilience has, has really come to the fore over the last five years. Uh, and the reason for that mainly been uh, the fact that we've been suffering the effects of global trade. Uh, and that has led to a very large number of new pests and diseases which have been affecting our forests. They've been very well documented and I'm not going to go on uh, about that uh, at great length. But on top of existing problems uh, such as wind blow, uh, really now is a timely time to think uh, about how we can create these, these new uh, resilient forests. But first of all, we have to know what we mean by resilience. And uh, there's a very good book in the Alice Holt Library called The Dictionary of Forestry, uh, written by this guy called John Helms. Uh, and the, the definition of resilience is the capacity of a plant community to regain normal function and development following disturbance. So basically what that means is that if a forest is disturbed, uh, then resilience means it, is, it has the inherent capacity to return to no normal function and development really quite quickly. And there's lots of different ways, some of which have been described by Graham already, uh, in which we can, we, we can build much more resilient forests. And I'm going to be going through uh, the main options that we have with us. Okay, and th these main options really are uh, species choice and the way we deploy those species. Uh, secondly, in the way in which we use silvicultural systems. And thirdly, and most importantly, I think genetics. We have to get our genetics right. And what I'm going to be doing in the rest of this presentation is really just talking about how we can use each of those three factors in terms of creating a more resilient forest estate. Uh, but I'm also very interested in what the knowledge base is like at the moment in order for us to be able to do that and where we can go to get good guidance uh, in terms of actually making this policy or, or, or any desire to create more resilient forests, have people got access to the information that they require. Okay, so first of all, species. Uh, this is a rather large, complex uh, table, but um, what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to look at what's happened in terms of pests and diseases over the last 10 years in terms of our, our choices of species. And right at the top, we've got a group of species which I've called traditional, uh, but so far unaffected. So that in, in, that's things like Douglas fir and Sitka spruce uh, and oak and cherry. And uh, the sort of silvicultural approach that we can carry out with those, the resilient approach, they're, they're <coughs> tried and tested species, and we can use those in terms of building a much more resilient forest estate. Uh, the second group uh, are the traditional but affected species. So they're things like the larches and the pines and ash. And uh, when I've travelled around the country and I've heard people speak, I'm, I'm, I'm rather concerned that a lot of people are writing off these species. Uh, and I've, I've labelled the silvicultural approach that we've got to use with this spe these species as patient. I think we're under a very, very different uh, situation and we've got to be patient and learn how we can use these species uh, in our silviculture in the future. The last group of species uh, are really the potential species, the other species that uh, we can add to if we have more knowledge of them. 
uh, in terms of creating a more uh, species diverse forest in the future. Uh, and I've called these innovative. Some of them we know quite a bit about, uh, others we don't know quite so much about. So we don't need to go mad with these species, but we do need to start to work together and learn more about where they can and where they can't be used. Uh, and just while I'm on this slide, I will actually be saying a little bit more about uh, Western Red Cedar, which is right at the top. Uh, that's traditional, but so far unaffected. And then later on, when I'm talking about genetics, uh, I'm going to be talking about Abies alba, European silver fir, uh, which is one of these uh, species which I think we should have an innovative approach to. Okay, so um, Western Red Cedar then. I'll just take this as an example of uh, whether or not our knowledge base is good enough and where we would go for guidance. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, Western Red Cedar, very good species. It, uh, it grows well on a wide range of sites throughout Britain. Uh, it can produce very good uh, timber quality. Uh, and I, what I'm interested to know is that if you agree with that, wh where would you go to get very good information about the silviculture and management of Western Red Cedar? Anybody got any ideas? Oregon, that's a good idea. Let's all go to Oregon. Well done. Yeah. Cornwall. I, yeah, okay. But um, I, I meant in terms of general guidance, the sort of forest research. Forest research, of course, forest research. Okay, yeah, that's good. Okay, so um, I, I asked myself the same question uh, and I came up with these three things. Um, first of all, there's this thing called the Ecological Site Classification Decision Support System version 3. This is freely available and it allows you to look at the way in which you can match species to different sites. Okay, and very importantly, it looks at what will happen under different climate change scenarios to those choices. It's a freely available decision support system. It is absolutely fantastic, and everybody in this room sh really should be using it uh, in, in, in terms of creating a more resilient forest estate. Uh, the other thing, which is what Caroline said, was to look at the forest research species and provenance web pages. There's a lot of very good information uh, in there. And if you want a publication, uh, Peter Savile's very good book, uh, A Silviculture of Trees Used in British Forestry. The second edition was published last year, uh, and that's a very good summary. Uh, it may even be for sale uh, at the bank. Um, okay, so those are the three, uh, th the three main things that I came up with. But... In terms of these innovative species, which I talked about, um, I, I, it's quite interesting. If you look at where most of the information came from in, in, in all that guidance, actually, it's this publication. Um, this is uh, Forestry Commission Bulletin 30. Uh, it was published in 1957, and it was a fantastic campaign of um, silvicultural research and timber properties research and existing knowledge and it was all compressed together in this really fantastic publication and what we're doing in forest research at the moment is slowly but surely we're trying to revise and update all the information that's uh, available in this book for the exotic or the non-native forest trees and also our native species and that information is going to be channeled through uh, onto our website. And uh, that, that's really important that we have up-to-date information on all the factors involved uh, in this new and diverse uh, suite of species that we'll be using uh, in our forestry practice. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about species and we know that uh, we have much better knowledge of, uh, of our options. And this is really reinforcing one of the points that Graham made earlier, is that we have to think about the way in which we deploy our species. Uh, so far, most of our forests have been pure stands, and I don't want to suggest that pure stands are not part of the way forward. They certainly are part of the way forward. But what we would probably do in terms of much more resilient forests is we would have much higher proportions of mixed species stands, much more higher proportions of stands which are mosaics. Uh, and really, these contribute to more resilient forests because, as Graham said, if you get a problem with one of the species and you're in a mixture, then you get compensatory growth and the other species will take over uh, uh, and, 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 and uh, give you a much more resilient forest. Um, so uh, these uh, approaches are, um, you know, I, I would hope they would be used uh, a lot more in the future. And this isn't always a problem in terms of mixtures because uh, the, uh, at heart I'm a forest scientist 
Uh, and there is uh, some very interesting work that's been done uh, on mixtures by Bill, who's sitting at the front, uh, who wrote a really tremendous paper on the Gisborne uh, mixtures experiment. And, and what we've got here are, these are the, th the seven different mixture combinations, and there's different mixture combinations of broad leaves and conifers. And then what we've got at the side here is we've got uh, basal area. Uh, and basically what, what, what it shows is that if, any, if anything uh, is above this line here, which is north, basically what it means is that the mixture is more productive than the equivalent areas of pure forest. And as you can see, most of the basal areas are way above that line. So the conclusion uh, in Bill's paper is that many of these mixture systems are actually much more productive than their equivalent component parts. And there's a whole load of science about why that should be in, in terms of the efficiency of re resource use. But very interestingly, uh, the Sitka spruce Sc Scots pine was significantly much more productive. So what I'm saying is that we might have to use mixtures in, uh, in the future. But actually, although there may be some, uh, some things about management, more difficulty of management, actually there may be productivity gains. But really what I'm saying is that we really need to know much, much more uh, about the way in which we use mixtures uh, in, in, in terms of creating a more resilient uh, forest estate. And I'm going to do the same thing again as I did earlier. If you wanted very good information about how you, um, how to form mixtures, how to manage mixtures in British forestry, where would you go? Oregon. Okay. <laughs> Any, anybody got any clues? Okay, right. Yeah, I think you're right, actually. It's a pretty tough on that, <laughs> and I think there's some work to do there. Uh, there is some good uh, guidance on uh, conifers and broadleaves in the uplands, but I think we do need there is a knowledge gap there in terms of giving good guidance uh, to the forestry industry uh, on the use of mixed uh, species stands uh, in Britain. Okay, the second part of the talk uh, is about silvicultural systems uh, and there's some uh, overlap here with what Graham was saying. Basically, we're in the process, we've been at continuous cover forestry for about 20 years now, just over 20 years, and basically we are working together uh, to understand how we can use different types of silvicultural systems to create a much more resilient forest estate. This is Douglas fir uh, at Longleat. Uh, this is Sitka spruce uh, up at Clackinog. And, and there's a whole uh, host of different initiatives going about and we, uh, you know, we are learning how to do this. And I agree wholeheartedly with Graham. I still think there's some way to go on this, but if you want good guidance uh, on, um, sorry, if you want if you want good guidance on how to do uh, continuous cover forestry, actually there is good guidance there. It's called Operational Guidance Booklet Seven. It's a freely available uh, PDF uh, publication which is available from the Forest Research website, and it's a very good introduction to how you do continuous cover forestry uh, in Britain. Uh, the slide that I missed out is that if you want to create with silvicultural systems a much more resilient forest estate, you do need to take the landscape scale approach. Uh, that you know we won't get a much more diverse, resilient estate if we basically change lock, stock, and barrel from one silvicultural system to another one. We have to have much more diversity of stand structures uh, in the landscape. Anyway, we've got good guidance on continuous cover forestry. But I don't want to give you the impression that we know everything uh, that, 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 that we need to know. Uh, Graham mentioned the point about uh, economics. I'm not quite so sure about that one. But in terms of silviculture and management, if you're managing a complex uh, CCF stand, such as a single tree selection system, one way of managing it is to compare a target structure. This is diameter against frequency. You can declare a target structure and then you can map out what the actual structure of your woodland is against your target structure and then form a thinning or a cutting plan with reference to those two sets of figures. But of course the key thing is how do you form that target structure and there's a lot about that in terms of different species and different sites and in forest research we're trying to give a much better approach uh, to that uh, through our scientific work.
the other thing which we don't know much about, and this is a really big black box, I think, uh, is growth and development. Uh, all of our growth and yield models at the moment are for single species, even age stands. Um, we've got a really very good project uh, in forest research, which is led by Tom Jenkins, uh, who's in the room at the moment. There's a poster uh, in the coffee room uh, about this uh, project. We have imported uh, a growth and yield model <coughs> excuse me, from Austria, uh, and we are calibrating it for Sitka spruce, so that very soon we will have a growth and yield model which tracks the development of individual trees rather than the average tree in a stand. Uh, basically to look at the stand development and growth and yield consequences of uh, Sitka spruce managed using continuous cover. Okay, lastly, and in the last five minutes, uh, sprinting towards the finish line, uh, I just want to say a little bit about genetics. It's really, really important. Uh, these are two ash trees planted on the same site uh, in Denmark. One of them has been very, very uh, heavily affected by Calara, the other one has not. And the most likely explanation for those two effects is the fact that there's a different genotype. So uh, we mustn't forget uh, genetics in terms of its contribution towards building a much more resilient uh, forest estate. And I just want to outline a couple of pieces of work that we have been doing or that we could do uh, in terms of contributing knowledge to, uh, in terms of genetics, to uh, developing more resilient forests. Um, the first piece of work is about the provenance of Abies alba. Uh, that's a, a map, basically, of its native range. Uh, Abies alba, basically, uh, we threw it in the dustbin in about the 1960s uh, because of concern about this thing called the silver fir, fir woolly aphid. And we said, no, the problems are too big there. We, we, we're not going to use that species. Uh, but we've been back and looked at some provenance studies that were planted in the 1960s. And they've basically shown that Ab Abies alba can grow at yield class 12 to 24 throughout Britain. So that really can contribute. And there are other very good silver fir species, Abies amabilis among, amongst them, that we can use to de develop a productive, resilient forest estate. Uh, this is some data, uh, and these are the different provenances, and this is the mean height uh, at age 45. Uh, and you can see that there is a group of provenances there. They tend to be from Calibria, which is on the toe of Italy at high altitude, uh, which are really, really very, very productive. Uh, so we've got very good knowledge and understanding of where we should be selecting seed from for Abies alba growing in this country. And scientifically, this is really very interesting because you will notice that the provenances that don't do very well don't do very well at both of the three sites. And the provenances that do very well do very well at both of the three sites. And the three sites are Benmore in Scotland, Radnor in Wales, and Thetford in the Dry East. So that's quite an amazing result. And it really shows what an adaptable species Abies alba can be growing in this country. The last point I want to make is about uh, Douglas fir, which is uh, one of our sort of like key species uh, in this country. And so far, the provenance work that we've been doing, we, we, we basically have focused on provenances from the uh, Washington coast and west of the Cascades in Washington, in terms of giving us uh, good provenances for use of Douglas fir in this country. But in a changing climate, uh, it may be that the more southerly provenances uh, become uh, possible to use in this country. So scientifically, we need to know uh, more about that uh, and not lose sight of provenance selection as an important part of forestry practice in Britain. Okay, so we've been through species, we've been through deployment, we've been through silvicultural systems, we've been through genetics, uh, and I just want to give a very brief summary uh, of uh, resilient forests. What are they? Pragmatically, they mean more diverse forests. How do we achieve them? Uh, we use a broader palette of species as mixtures or mosaics, a wider range of silvicultural systems, and don't forget genetics. And then lastly, is our knowledge base good enough? The answer, as far as I'm concerned, is no. And I want to be clear with you that what we are doing here is that we are rethinking current forestry practice in Britain. 
And in order to do that and build a much more resilient forest estate, we must have a very sound evidence base for that. Thank you very much.